Hi, um, thank you very much for making it here tonight. Um, uh, I'm an architect, as you probably heard from the introduction, um, and we do design work, we do design projects, but I'm not going to talk to you about that work. I'm going to talk to you more about the research work that we do, um, and the research work that I undertake is through Columbia University. I have a lab there called C Lab. So I'll show you some of the work, um, research work, and um, I'm going to keep it relatively brief to about 40 minutes um, with the hope that, that you will find it of interest and want to ask questions about it. Like, why would an architect want to spend so much energy doing research rather than exclusively doing design? But hopefully that will become self apparent to you. Um, with with C Lab, um, we we do many different kinds of projects. We do installations, we do videos, we do publications. Um, we we did a book recently called World of Giving, and we um, also are undertaking a number of publications at the moment. Um, in addition to that, we um, um, contribute to Volume Magazine. One of, we're one of the three. Um, editor parties of Volume Magazine. Um, it includes Arcus in Amsterdam, AMO, um, Red Cool House's Research Consultancy, and C Lab at Columbia. And so we've done a number of different issues on um, housing, on ambition, um, many issues on China, um, hope, um, sustainability, content management, uh, American 60s counterculture, um, and I'll give you a sense, just a little bit, of some of the flavor of the research that we do um, at C Lab, and then I'll show you two ongoing projects that we're working on. And with these ongoing projects, um, I have to just let you know now that there are no conclusions to them. They're really in process, and so um, uh, in this way, it'll give you a sense of what we're immediately focused on, what our interests are, but it's not going to have the degree of resolution or a set of assertions um, that are absolute in our minds of the direction that we should take this. It's very much in process. Um, but to give you some example of what we do, this is a, um, a study that we did of Kazakhstan. We were interested in looking at Kazakhstan um, in 2007 because that's when there was so much construction going on there. This is a photograph of Almaty, the, the capital of Kazakhstan, which, um, as you know, um, when oil was found and when there was technology that was understood to be able to extract that oil, uh, that um, foreign investment uh, began to happen in Kazakhstan. And this is some of the construction that's going on with the capital there. Um, this is the main axis of, of, develop, uh, of the, the capital um, as it was being built then. Instead of just focusing on rapid urbanization in Kazakhstan as, um, as rapid urbanization is happening in China and elsewhere, we want to focus on other things that were taking place in Kazakhstan, other things that were part of the design culture, the visual art culture there that probably would get mix, missed if only um, someone came in and started to look at the, the urban process. So we went to many different places. We met with the, um, the head of the National Architecture Institute. We met with people at architecture schools. And we also went to art schools. And some of the things that we found that were, were, were very interesting to us um, were things like in this photo, uh, an obsession with the diagonal. Like, there's no reason why all of the artwork here is mounted on a diagonal, it just is. Um, and that that idea of diagonals permeated everything in this school. Uh, I mean, even with the Cyrillic writing, that there was an emphasis on the diagonal in terms of the way that the typography was used. Um, even things in this uh, art school, like maintenance of the architecture, um, were, were it was evident that even the diagonal was respected in cases where things like patterning involved uh, diagonal treatments. Um, uh, you know, as you know, because it is a, a former Soviet state, uh, that, that gold is used in terms of architectural iconography all over the place. So this is an inventory of, of all the various shades of gold that um, are there in not only cultural in, in, in buildings, but also in commercial buildings. Um, Almaty is known for um, being um, one of the most extreme capitals, extreme in terms of weather. So it gets down to 45 
minus 45 Celsius in the winter, and it gets up to 45 Celsius in the summertime. Um, and this is some of the construction that was going on there when we visited. This is a new building, it's not an old building. And a lot of it has to do with the variations in temperature that happen over the course of the year and the ability to, to um, get as precise as possible uh, in terms of the craftsmanship uh, with these kinds of weather extremes. This is one of the, the main buildings on the capital axis. I believe this is the treasury building, the state treasury building. And this is after its completion. It, it was, um, it, it was uh, shortly after the completion of the building um, and the windows began to pop out because of the expansion uh, due to weather. Um, this is the education building. The same thing was happening in terms of the, um, the, the popping out of the glazing. Um, also, as, uh, as um, warm weather progressed, things like the insulation started popping out of buildings, uh, like in this case here. Um, and so this is the layout that we did ultimately in Volume Magazine of this little um, research that we did. This is the spread on the diagonal, um, the spread on gold, and um, the, the spread on detail or craftsmanship. Again, these are all relatively recent buildings. We're also currently, or we, we completed some work on aging. This is a video that we did for an issue on um, aging and urbanization. So the, the point of the video is that we often think about elderly people as people who are checked out, that, that are not um, active members of society in terms of um, engaging the political process or being aware of urban processes. And the, what we want to say in this video is, well, what if they are? I mean, what if you can think about um, elderly as actually being active agents in terms of urbanization? And it doesn't matter whether it's true or not. The, the point would be to try to shift one's understanding of a particular um, demographic and to think out how, um, if you do so, that the way that you would respond and think about urbanism uh, in that case would be shifted. Um, so that was the hypothesis, like to try to um, shift people's understanding of the status of the elderly in our culture and also to think about potentially um, they being highly informed about urban processes. Um, and so we did this volume on um, uh, aging and we found out some interesting things like um, even though during the global recession that there was a um, as, you, as you all probably have witnessed, um, a decrease in construction worldwide. Why is it that even in, in countries like um, Spain and Portugal, as, as well as all through Western Europe, that the quality of public spaces um, got even better? Uh, it wasn't that there was a slowdown in terms of the construction of public spaces, um, there was an increase. And the, the, that the quality of existing public spaces didn't stay the same or decline, they actually improved in quality. Um, and the same goes for New York, that um, in New York City, that um, all through the economic recession is when all of the great public spaces of recent time were created and a number of existing ones were renovated um, to, to become uh, uh, as desirable as they are now. And these are just some examples of it. Um, and that led us to think of just why is that happening? What's, who are the agents involved uh, in this kind of um, 
civic improvement despite economic decline. Um, so we began to look at the issue more closely and, um, and started with the generation that was born um, during World War II, that is the people who are about 70 to 75 now. And um, we found out that these are maps of um, the, the five cities in Europe that were the most bombed uh, during World War II, both on the Allied side and um, on the, the German side. And then these are the um, neighborhoods that were the most intensely bombed during World War II. Um, they happen to also be the oldest <laughs> neighborhoods in Europe, meaning that there are more people who live there that are 60 years old and over per capita than any other neighborhoods um, in Europe. And so um, we're, uh, our theory was that it was the very shock of, of young people who were living there of the devastation that took place during the war that they wanted to um, uh, and, and witnessing you know the their cities being destroyed um, that they wanted to do something um, that would help them cope with it and the fact that they never moved away from those neighborhoods is something that in our minds has to do with the idea that um, possibly um, as a coping mechanism, as the shock of the war, they decided that they would never leave. Um, and um, um, we discovered um, a conspiracy, uh, which is yet to be disproven, um, that uh, there are bands of elderly people who are actually actively attempting to improve the quality of urban spaces. Um, so it may be even your grandparents who are involved, but they're not telling you about it. Um, that. Um, that are working to improve public spaces, that they're involved in public policy, um, that they're um, thinking of ways in which investment could take place within the urban realm as a way to improve spaces. So we just started photographing um, suspicious looking elderly people in New York um, who we think are masterminds of, part of, of this uh, conspiracy, um, who are on the lookout um, in urban spaces looking for the ways um, in which urban spaces could be improved and um, and finding um, thinking of tactics which can improve that. Um, so just to, to kind of do more research on this conspiracy theory we had, um, we looked at the five stages of grief, um, this very standard psychological model of, of trauma. Um, so there's the moment of trauma, um, and that's followed by a moment of denial, um, and then anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Um, we also did some research um, between 1945 and 2010 and, uh, on Google Books, and we looked at the frequency of the use of the word city in book publications. Um, and then this is a chart that shows the, the frequency, so like a low point, a high point, low point, and then an increase. Um, and if you overlay those two diagrams together, they actually fit um, very well. So um, this moment here of the trauma, 1945, um, denial here in the 1960s, uh, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance all in relationship to the city. Uh, um, and to further prove our point of this conspiracy, um, you, you know when a building is a really good work of architecture? When you see old people around them. That is the, the true test of whether buildings are, um, are working well. Um, and so I just give you a few examples of, you know, of Flickr photographs um, that show um, elderly people um, posing um, in architecture. Um, uh, we think that these people are spies who are trying to find um, aspects of design that they could use in future um, projects of theirs. Um, and so if you take this diagram of, of ours um, and you overlay it onto architectural history, it also works incredibly well. Um, so if you look at um, uh, the trauma here and then look at the post-war period, you have post-war housing and urban reconstruction which corresponds to denial, um, and then reactions to modernist failures as a moment of anger, 
Um, and then bargaining and depression as vernacular design in everyday urbanism. Um, and then globalization as finally a form of acceptance to that trauma. Um, so uh, 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 even though um, our theory hasn't been um, rejected or disputed by anyone, um, and uh, because it hasn't, uh, we think it's actually possibly true. Um, but, but whether or not it is true, uh, it, it, um, in the publication, we present it as if the conspiracy is in fact uh, something that's going on. And the point of doing that, to tell this story, um, to use conspiracy theory as a narrative tool, um, is one in which um, it enables then a rethinking of how you can engage aging as, a, as an urban crisis and to think about it in ways of addressing it um, rather than just simply um, taking your stereotypical understanding of um, elderly people and providing housing for them. So in that sense, conspiracy theory and other types of fictional devices are things that we deploy as part of our urban planning thinking. Um, now, some of the current research that we're doing, um, uh, I'll give you two examples uh, of that. The, the first one is uh, um, uh, an interest in technology and the city. And um, we did a preliminary publication called Adaptation um, that, that looks at um, the rise of interest by people outside of architecture who are interested in the city. So, um, while, while we in architecture um, are thinking of whatever it might be, um, new ways to design, new approaches to design, um, companies like IBM and Siemens are interested in thinking of ways in which they can apply their um, digital technology and information systems to the management of infrastructure and human, man um, human resources. Um, companies um, like, uh, that are also manufacturers of large um, infrastructural machinery are thinking of ways in which they can apply technologies to optimize things like transportation systems. And so um, the, the interest in looking at, at technology in the city came from the fact that outside of architecture, there are many different sectors that were focused on it. Um, and so as we began to look at it, we want to document the fact that um, technology is simply becoming uh, a normal fact of life within the city. Um, and things that um, normally we think of as being old um, are also integrated with things that are new. Um, uh, like um, small shops in the middle of nowhere in America um, that sell ice and beer or whatever um, automatically now have Wi-Fi. Um, the fact that people text while they also bike um, as an urban phenomenon. Um, in China, public sculpture that integrates technology. Um, the, the typologies of buildings are changing as well. Um, libraries no longer have books. Um, and that, that also sometimes libraries no longer have buildings. Um, that they're instead um, transformed into mobile digital libraries where a truck comes to a neighborhood and allows people to um, either engage through um, terminals or to download books, um, which is a phenomenon that, that you know, I think that we've all read about. But the fact that the, um, the Library of Congress in the US um, is actually using this as a, as a tool to um, encourage people to read um, right in front of their building as a substitute for their building demonstrates the extreme to which um, technology is transforming its relationship to architecture. Um, also, urban spaces are transforming. So this is a project um, by a company where um, they're trying to um, enter into the grocery store business by eliminating the grocery store as a building. Um, the idea is that um, the company could rent public infrastructure and then flatten the grocery store so that it's just on walls and that you can scan um, uh, products that you like and then um, it's delivered to you at your home. Uh, um, buildings within the urban landscape are also being transformed. So um, this is a, an old shopping mall that is now being used as a data server farm. Um, there are elements within the urban sphere that uh, were, were um, 
public amenities at one point, um, where the property is seen as being so important by telecommunication companies, they're keeping the elements, but they're transforming their functions. Um, so this is a pay telephone booth that's transformed into a local Wi-Fi um, connector. Um, even the way in which we use um, private space is transforming. Um, uh, these are, we, we just looked up on Flickr, um, party and technology, and these are the kinds of photos that we found. It's not like this is uh, um, uh, an isolated case. Um, and you know, we, we're hearing all about the, um, uh, that, that with IBM and with um, other companies that already they're implementing um, ways that they are improving cities, um, most importantly through sensors, sensors that detect things that are going on in the city and then supposedly um, that information is directed to public service entities well, that that um, simply improve it. So this we just looked at um, fairly randomly um, uh, an intersection in Chicago and these are all the sensors that happen to be in this place. So everything from um, uh, light sensors that turn on street lights um, when it gets darker, um, inlaid pavement sensors that detect cars and motorcycles and bicycles and then communicate with traffic controllers wirelessly, um, pavement sensors here um, that are used to detect whether or not bridges are freezing over, um, underwater bridge pier sensors <laughs> that monitor the structural safety of the, pier, of the um, bridge, um, river sensors that measure water conditions, um, water heights and flows of the river, um, parking sensors here, um, anemometers to measure wind, um, weather and air quality sensors, um, accelerometers that measure the movement of buildings, um, traffic control switches, motion detectors, um, entryway sensors into buildings, water sensors, carbon di dioxide and surveillance sensors inside of buildings, fire sensors, emergency management, communication sensors, um, and then my favorite, um, audio sensors um, that, are, that are located um, on traffic lights that are intended to detect gunfire, uh, which is then reported to um, police agencies. Um, um, but even though supposedly there are these super sophisticated sensors that exist throughout the city, I wonder whether or not those sensors really work well. And if they're, they're working in the way that they were intended to and whether they're as efficient as they're said to be. For example, this is um, a face recognition sensor that we pointed at the sky. Um, and so you can see that it's detecting a face there. Um, uh, there are automatic default protocols in terms of information gathering um, technologies that, um, that when it thinks it sees a face, it erases it or blurs it. Um, and um, even though with, with things like Google Street Maps, um, there, there is a lot of human editing. Um, this is simply to say that the human editing that is involved, uh, the human judgment that is involved, can't um, correct every default mode in which um, sensors are working through the city. Um, other times, too, when faces are already covered up, that they're further um, blurred out as a default mechanism. Um, this is the work of um, uh, an artist who who spends his day going through Google Street Maps um, looking for unexpected beauty. Um, and so this is um, something that you know, we call automatic art, um, where um, uh, types of um, surrealist um, imagery happens um, that he's able to capture. Um, so you know, basically, he started in the northern part of Europe, and uh, apparently he's in France somewhere at the moment uh, in terms of his switching. <laughs> Um, and even in terms of the way that simple media technology works, that there are um, things where um, the, the forms of media that are intended to help us um, are proliferated with glitches. Um, and that glitches is part of the, 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 the technology infrastructure that we deal with. Um, there's talk of ubiquitous computing. Um, wireless throughout cities um, that are provided for cities um, so that people can freely use Wi-Fi wherever they want to, which to me kind of reminds me of um, um, zombie movies, you know, like when people like get, you know, 
like some the zombie bites them and they die and then they wake up again and they start walking through cities as if they're um, half dead. I mean, I kind of feel like that we produced a, an urban uh, culture of zombieism where now um, in desperate efforts in order to send something to the office or um, in order to um, send something to a friend, that we're walking around cities with our laptops trying to find a, a, a Wi-Fi connection. Um, and so if this is the idea of urban convenience, um, it seems to me that, that there's still problems in terms of um, the way that it's going to work out, or at least the ideal of what ubiquitous computing is, um, is something that potentially could be benefited from the thoughts and ideas of architects. Um, so, th like, if if um, things like um, bike furniture um, that allow you to lock up your bike as a way to promote um, alternative modes of transportation um, in cities, and things like planters that are intended to not only beautify cities but to help um, create water absorption and reduce the heat sink effect of cities. If these are urban elements that are now supposed to be common through cities, um, I mean, I wonder, and, and the fact that you have ubiquitous computing, I mean, I wonder if this is really the image of what an ideal urban condition is supposed to be. I mean, it has all the attributes of what we as, as architects would probably advocate, um, but when put together, it seems like it's an uncomfortable um, condition. Um, also, uh, the nature of public interaction um, in a culture of Wi-Fi is something that we want to document within this um, um, publication. Um, so um, this is what we call tethering. Um, when you do have Wi-Fi um, in things like airports, um, people are tethered together around power sources in order to use the Wi-Fi. Um, but they're not talking to each other, they're just they're uncomfortably next to each other because of the fact that they need to share um, a, a modern day convenience. Um, and the wake of technology, the, you know, the, if you think of technology uh, as a boat that's speeding forward and advancing in terms of new innovations, um, all of us live, or you know, probably all of us, not, maybe there's something that don't, live in the wake of technology. We're not at the forefront of the boat experiencing all the new developments that are happening. We're somewhere back in the wave um, uh, uh, of generations, maybe one or two generations back of cutting edge technology, and that our environments are ones that look more like this than Apple stores. Um, and that the interiors, um, uh, uh, you know, of workspaces. Again, we just Googled workspaces and cords, um, and this is what we came up with. Um, has led to different kinds of de design devices to respond to cord management, wire management. Um, and the wire management is something that um, is uh, commonplace within workspaces. Um, which led us to begin to think about um, uh, the 1950s, um, architecture in the 1950s and 60s, which to us was this ideal moment because there was a single aesthetic that integrated building technology, so if you think of steel and glass architecture, um, the construction technology in order to do that, communication technology like telephones and typewriters, um, industrial design technology um, to produce furniture, um, uh, could all be integrated into a single aesthetic and that the quality the quality of design and the quality of technology was measured by its permanence. Um, so the idea that you can build something like this and build it to last um, uh, seems like a perfect moment in terms of thinking about the ways in which design and technology could be integrated together. Um, but that today, the advancements in technology um, are different and the relationship to design is different. Technology is is evolving so fast. Um, if, if you take something like Moore's Law, the idea that every 18 months um, that the capacity of a, a, a chip to double in terms of the memory that it can hold and decrease in size um, is something, if you apply that idea to computers and the technologies that you have in your offices, within the lifespan of a building, let's say a building lasts 15 years, um, at least every other year, there's going to be a technology upgrade. 
So you can't have the kind of permanence that you had in the 1950s, um, where it, you, you install a, a computer um, in an integrated way into the desk, because, um, or to put a screen, a monitor integrated into the wall, because more than likely, within a couple of years, it's going to be torn out for new technology to replace it. If, 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 the, if the company um, that you work for is at all interested in design or technology, they're going to be want, they want to be up to date, which means that there's a tenuous relationship between architecture and technology rather than um, a sympathetic one. And this form of replacement um, of updating technologies is something that we see all around us. So for example, this is an um, airport where um, there used to be a larger um, information screen here, um, but um, that was replaced by something that is higher resolution, probably flatter and more efficient. And the, the compositional relationship between what was formerly there and what is now being replaced successively um, is one where um, the, the display appears to be more of an afterthought than something that was consciously designed. Um, this is another airport uh, uh, that's being um, renovated. The, the telephone booths are, are um, taken out, um, and this is its current state now. Uh, this was taken like two months ago. Um, uh, and the, the scale of transformation and technologies don't just apply to things like desks and, and telephones. Um, the, the technology is happening so fast that it's also transforming um, architectural typologies. So these are two airports that were planned in the 90s and built in the early 2000s um, um, in anticipation of uh, increased global travel because of globalization. Um, and, um, and so the terminals got much bigger um, to facilitate the throughput of people going through airports. Um, and they were right that there were more people that were going through airports and, uh, and uh, the, the travel increased greatly. But it was shortly after these terminals were built that, um, and even, even despite 9-11, um, the use of interactive kiosks made the need to have um, queues and uh, people working at these gates um, superfluous. Um, so um, the, the fact that technology would happen so fast that it transforms, it makes obsolete the scale of airport terminals um, is something also that we want to comment on. So this was the ideal aesthetic of, um, of design, technology, um, architecture, um, uh, industrial design in the 50s, um, you know, these are landscapes that are common today in terms of our workplace. Um, you know, this is a, a beautiful SOM building where um, the idea of having a unified aesthetic to the interior extended all the way to things like, um, uh, this is the first building, um, uh, well, you know, like with SOM, they designed this lighting system uh, where they were able to get enough distance between the light bulb and the um, uh, diffuser so that you've got a uniform light pattern throughout. So this was something that they were doing. They were still able to do it within a um, floor to ceiling height that was um, quite optimal for work use. It wasn't super low. But with this building, it's the first one where they're also able to integrate the HVAC system into the suspended ceiling. So all the diffusers for the building are located within these very, very thin strips. So the idea that you get mechanical technology as well as um, uh, structural technologies and design aesthetics all to be coming into one is something that, um, that uh, simply can't happen today. Um, the, the rate of innovation is happening at such different speeds um, that architects need to cope with the fact that, um, that there is no longer the possibility of a one-to-one -one correspondence. Um, and so with this research, um, what we're trying to, to advocate um, are um, ideas for design processes that take into effect these real conditions. So for example, um, is it possible that, um, well, well, our assertion is that digital te technology is good for two things. Digital technology is good for um, advancing computer technology, computer science, and digital technology is also really good at improving other technologies. 
So in terms of directions for architecture, um, you know, one can think of two different ones that digital technology is used as a way to provide greater access to information for people who, who you know, are in buildings and that the, the, the course that architects ought to pursue is to create more sophisticated minority report-like interfaces within interior environments. Um, the other is for digital technologies to improve architectural technologies like mechanical systems, like building construction systems, um, um, so on and so forth. And what we want to advocate is the latter. Forget the access to information aspect of technology and focus on ways in which technologies, digital technology can improve the things that already exist in architecture. So if that's the case, um, I do things like mechanical systems, um, uh, plumbing systems, electronic systems, electrical systems could all be improved through digital technology and potentially um, the amount of space that they occupy in buildings could be reduced. Um, and when coupled with the design of forms that work passively, that the, that the um, workload that technologies need to undertake could also be reduced. So that way, there went, we're, not, you know, we're not trying to nostalgically call for a, um, an integration back to the kinds of um, integrations that happened in modernism, but rather new ones where um, the relationship at least is one that builds upon um, itself. And this has led us to, to look more closely at the second topic that I'll describe, and that's that we're looking at building systems. Um, and um, we're, you know, we, you know, the technology stuff got us interested in thinking of, tech, um, of uh, building systems. Um, so we just began to look at how much space within a building um, that mechanical, electrical, and plumbing take up. Um, and so um, with the help of BIM, um, building information management. Um, these are different examples of the amount of um, space that exists within buildings that are related to systems. Um, you can think of things like um, sock puppets. Do you know what those things are? You know, they're socks that you put on your hands and then you uh, make little faces on it and stuff and then you, you have plays and stuff with the sock puppets. We kind of think of mechanical systems as like sock puppets. Like ba basically they're your hands and the building is everything else. Um, like they're the parts that you don't see of the building, but they're the things that create the experience of the building. They're the things that are underneath the aesthetics and appearance of the building. Um, they're the things that make the building work. Um, and what we want to do through these diagrams is to simply um, reveal the amount of space that, that um, they occupy. Um, as well as to, this, this, this is a concept that we came up with that we call freeze. Um, not you know, like an architectural freeze, but also like an air conditioning, um, uh, to talk about the integration of, um, uh, uh, or not the integration, but the coping of the fact that you just, um, sometimes the, the, uh, like a sock puppet, the thumb or the, the hands uh, begins to stick out of the building um, and become integrated into the aesthetic of the building. Um, and even things where, um, where there's a celebration of building systems. I mean, it, it, I think the fact that there's so few buildings that do that, it's really to point to the exception that there's an acknowledgement of building systems um, as an important part of architecture. Um, and this is the only recent example of a type of Pompidou um, uh, aesthetic in architecture more recently, um, which is the, a server farm for Google. Uh, where they, you know, Google famously has bikes throughout their campuses and stuff. Um, but the only reason why, you know, they're, are, you know, that they, they paint this is to brand their server farms with the colors of, of Google. But it's not to say that somehow, um, that architecturally, uh, or in terms of design innovation, that they're thinking about mechanical systems. Um, you probably um, remember from the movie Brazil, um, the Robert De Niro character. Um, who's um, thought to be a terrorist uh, because he's trying to hack into the building systems that are state-run uh, because the state is concerned that he might be diverting resources from one building to another. Um, um, but, but I think this kind of crazy satirical image from Brazil of what building systems are is not so far off from what building systems are today. 
Um, uh, you know, like in America, um, all of the uh, heating is forced air systems. There's no radiant um, heating there um, for, for the most part. And that was because the air conditioning industry advocated and standardized forced air as the default technology. And so, um, you know, 30% of buildings are dedicated to mechanical systems because of the volume of ducts need to be so large. If you look back at, at Gideon's mechanization takes command, um, this was, um, you know, like a modern revelation of the importance of, of technolo technological things um, and the aesthetics of technology. But the book, as much as it does deal with um, uh, a new aesthetic um, that's related to industry, it doesn't deal with building systems to any great degree. And the idea that modern architects were invested in thinking of integrating building technologies um, into their aesthetic is something that we want to evaluate. So this is Crown Hall. This is a model of Crown Hall. Um, uh, this, this is me, Spandero. Uh, and you see the beautiful, pure, um, open space of the building. Um, the columns, structurally, are to the perimeter of the building, so that it was able to achieve uh, an expansive open space, column-free, within the interior. Um, this is the building on the outside. Um, but, um, as much as you would think of Mies as somebody who was deeply invested in modernization in the sense of thinking about the way the mechanical systems work, there's one blip to the building. It's the me mechanical system. Um, and this is the mechanical penthouse on top of Crown Hall, which is not in the model. Um, and um, so we looked at archival sketches that Mies did of Crown Hall. Um, and the, um, the mechanical systems that connect um, equipment that's in the bottom and draws the air outward and then up to the ceiling. Um, and the different ways in which he tried to figure out a way to integrate the, these massive forms within what is supposed to be universal space. And his struggle to figure out what to do with it is paradoxical in the sense that um, if his idea of universal space was these expansive open interiors, it was only by virtue of mechanical systems that those kinds of large spaces would be possible. Um, that you needed that kind of ventilation, um, uh, artificial ventilation, in order for open spaces like that to work. And yet, his own designs struggle with how to figure out where to put the mechanical system in this open space here. So here's one version where he puts the, um, the huge mechanical system in the center. Um, another one where he attempts to pseudo hide them uh, within the, um, the restrooms uh, here. Um, another one where the, um, the mechanical systems are pulled out from the core so they read more as objects. Um, the, the fact that this piece of paper is crumpled up I think is no coincidence. I think he was just simply frustrated. He couldn't figure out really where to put it and still have the, the simplicity of the open space be something that um, would be in line with his thinking. Um, uh, so, you know, we start to just look up the final version of the plan, um, you know, but if you look up um, Mies van der Rohe, Crown Hall, uh, you'll see that there are several definitive versions of the plan, um, all having to do with the location, um, discrepancies in the location of the mechanical systems. So the one thing that's not free in the free space um, are these columns here, or, you know, the, these, these forms here, uh, which draw up the air from the bottom up to the mechanical um, penthouse above. And it's even interesting that the iconic view, the photograph of the building, is actually taken from a few steps up here um, where you don't see the mechanical penthouse above. Um, there are other approaches that modern architects um, have taken. This is Wallace Harrison at um, the UN building. Um, uh, um, uh, Mumford, Lewis Mumford complained bitterly of the fact that he just let it all hang out there. Um, that he just put, let the ducts be visible um, uh, as, 
uh, ambassadors and heads of state entered into the building. Um, Khan, um, uh, you know, the famously the, the idea of servant and served space, um, where he put mechanical systems um, into um, the, the structural cores of the building. Um, and I think this is really interesting too with um, this laboratory at University of Pennsylvania, where the mechanical systems um, are even oversized and abstracted so that they become the facades of buildings. Um, so you see the stacks here for it. Um, but I kind of like think that maybe the idea that, that you would um, associate mechanical systems with structural systems is arbitrary. Like they don't actually need each other. Um, they, 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 there's no reason why they ought to go together. So the, the fact that he's thought this through um, you know, is, is considerable and admirable, but it's not like it's a natural association that the two things need to go together. Um, and, you know, and, and frankly, with the servant and served space thing, I always get them mixed up anyway. Like, which is the served space and which is the servant space? You know? um, so, so, yeah, the, so the research that we're doing now, um, in addition to technologies to think out um, the way that building systems work. And so one of our concepts is BIMness. Um, so like if, if Rob Coolhouse's idea of bigness is that architecture um, through market demands has gotten so large um, that, that architects don't have the design control um, over their buildings and that, that the correspondence between the outside of the building and the interior of the building can't be something that um, is expressed, that there's a disconnection between those two. Um, the idea that architecture, when it gets so large, can't be figurative or be gestural and respond to urban um, circumstances around it because the building is just too unwieldy to do so. The idea that you can't have detail in a building because um, the building is so large that you can't design for that um, were all things that I think were super interesting observations that he made. Um, and he was probably thinking about buildings that at the time when he wrote it, which was in like, I think, 97, um, buildings that were probably a million square feet. Um, but with BIM and other um, software systems, uh, it's actually not unreasonable to do a two million square foot building. Uh, I mean, the technologies now allow us to design at a large scale and to have much more control as architects over the design. Um, so um, the idea of BIMness for us is um, how can architects um, uh, rethink and revise Coolhouse's um, resignation or acceptance of the fact that big buildings can't be designed. Maybe they can and maybe um, the, the technologies now allow us to manage those things. Um, what we're interested in is this, um, you know, if you think of Kahn and, and Harrison as, as different approaches to um, dealing with the aesthetics of building design and technology, we're really interested in this lineage from Mies onward. Um, this is a very faint plan of the Sana um, Toledo Glass Museum. And, um, you know, the, the museum is super beautiful. Uh, it has those double glazed walls, and in between them is where the mechanical systems go. Um, and, if, and if you look at interior photographs, you'll see that none of the sprinkler heads are visible. Um, they specced it so that the heads um, were recessed into the ceilings and then patched over. So it's a totally smooth ceiling. Um, you don't see any intakes whatsoever. But in order to get this clean plan, um, the entire basement is filled with mechanical systems. Um, that that you know, this, the systems become this large. So this is the full extent of the plan of the building, um, which gives you some sense of the scale of the main trunks of the mechanical systems and how they're distributed throughout the space. Um, so if this is Mises' idea of universal space, the extension of space, um, the reality of it is something more like this. Um, and um, in our thinking of, of building systems, what we want to do is to get back to this, um, but not through the idea that those systems would be repressed, um, but possibly through design means that reduces the extent of the volume of, of mechanical systems and buildings. So, um, so anyway, those are 
the two projects we're working on, and I'd be glad to answer any questions that you have about it. Thanks. very interesting projects you showed us. I have a question concerning the research on public space. Yeah. Because you, you mentioned a couple of times that it's not been proven um, wrong. So yeah. I wonder why should it be proven wrong? Because it's not academic research. I mean, it's about the production of an idea. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you. That's, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just to say that um, that it is an idea, and yeah, it's it's about the production of ideas, and it's about the production of ideas um, that attempt to challenge what we think are are false assumptions or, or assumptions that don't necessarily have to be the case. And so, the idea of presenting this uh, um, conspiracy uh, is to suggest that our take of of the elderly population and their presence within the urban realm is something that could be very much um, rethought. But secondly, in thinking about, you know, in proposing this conspiracy, it, it's also, also to say that the people who could be active in contributing to improving public space might be a very different demographic than we, we suppose. That in fact, the aging population, who are supposed to be the very source of um, urban crises that we're about to, to witness, um, could be the the very agents um, that could be instrumental in proving public space. Yeah. Um, let me um, let me disprove. Uh, <laughs> if I may. Yes. Or attempt to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I'll do it both as an aging person <laughs> and um, although I hate to admit it, I'm, <laughs> I'm just going to pretend that I'm an aging person <laughs> and as somebody who. Um, occasionally involved in projects in the urban sphere. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of things that I've noticed, and this is a very, very informal survey, would be, for example, uh, in New York, um, on some of the um, uh, riverside promenades that mm -hmm. comprise the Greenway, is to begin to count uh, people with the same uh, proper hair color that I have and that you're beginning to get. Mm -hmm. And one begins to find that in tremendous amount of public space, that there's fewer and fewer uh, people who I would say are over uh, 50 years of age mm -hmm. who make use of them in part because of the nature of the public space yeah. and the activities therein, but also if one, let's take New York as an example, retreats into some of the neighborhoods, be it recently gentrified or um, upscaled neighborhoods in Brooklyn yeah. or uh, radically changing neighborhoods like Harlem mm -hmm. in which there's uh, a, ethnic cleansing going on by large influx of um, young aspiring professional people and yeah. of uh, overpopulations of students, but that there is a banishing of older people. Mm. And I would propose that not only do older people um, are part of the, comprise the population of a generation that helped contribute to urban crises, but they might be those that have an experience of urban processes and of forms of community that were quite different than the anomie that you described um, owing to uh, the zombies, for example. Right. So I, I, I would um, say that unfortunately the conspiracy does not exist. Yeah. And unfortunately um, changing demographics and the repossession of urban core by people who have extremely high disposable income, yeah. um, it's, it disproves it. Yeah. Uh, and, and I say this in part, you know, not to um, be a crotchety old guy, right. but also to be a bit of a gadfly by uh, I'm putting forth what I've just said. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that those, those are all really good examples. And, and the fact that, uh, um, well, I mean, I, I don't know if that's really the case. I mean, I, I don't think that there are fewer older people in those public spaces. Um, and certainly, um, 
you know, uh, Columbus Circle, Grand Park, um, Brooklyn um, Promenade. I mean, it, it's a space that's frequented by um, by the elderly. So there are definitely um, shifts in demographics in neighborhoods. Um, and the the point I think you know we want to make here is that the people who would, one of the groups of people who would be deeply aware of the urban dynamics in their cities are the elderly. And it might also be the case that those people who are deep you know, aware of it and are sometimes impacted by it um, are also people that might be very invested in terms of changes to the urban environment. So, um, you know, I think if your point is that there are improvements that are happening to cities and sometimes it means that they're at the expense of the elderly, um, I, I mean, I don't think it's to say that it's a thing where um, they failed, but it's more to say that I think we can think about um, groups that are part of the urban dynamic of, of changing cities, um, and that one of them might be actually elderly people as agents of change. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I mean, I think for us, the more people who would actually contest our conspiracy, the better, because it means that there would be more attention that would be drawn to it, and the more attention that, that would be uh, drawn to the topic, um, all the better in terms of thinking about um, uh, aging in the city. So, uh, like, a, a fact that I think is, is so informative is that um, um, the EU has a group that's studying aging populations in cities, um, and they're affiliated with the, the WHO. And their recommendation is that um, the best uh, public policy uh, as a health policy to, to help the elderly is not through community centers, it's not through social services, it's not through medical clinics and whatnot, that the net benefit in terms of cost um, uh, is that uh, is to improve the quality of urban space. So improving the materials that are used on sidewalks, the dimensions of sidewalks, to improve traffic systems, um, to design systems where um, it's easier for people of all ages to cross sidewalks, um, will have a better public policy effect than any of those other things. Which I just think is amazing. You know, like if if a, an architect or urban planner proposed that you know, people would be immediately suspicious that it would be driven by self-interest. But the fact that other people see that the built environment is that important um, as a design element, um, I, I mean, I think it's something that is so helpful for us as architects to think about what the consequences are um, for the way that we design and the elements that we design. Sorry, it's my turn. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks a lot You're for the presentation. I really found it interesting and useful. And I don't know who is going to hunting all these images. Oh. Like some of them are live images, not from through internet or oh. digital, I guess. Yeah. So uh, since you are in Istanbul, we saw many uh, cities, blah blah. But I would like to know the <laughs> position of Istanbul in terms of conspiracy theory. Uh. <laughs> uh -huh. So we, we we didn't likely experience the World War Two, uh, but we have enough Cold War <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> and capitalism, <laughs> yeah, yeah. postmodernism, so called. So whatever you want, you can find uh, Roman Byzantine architecture and Islamic architecture, of course. Yes. So yeah. what do you think? Uh, Istanbul. Yes. Uh, okay. Hardcore well, course subject is Istanbul, please. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. I mean. We're, uh, with Colombia, we're actually here um, to study urbanization, and, and the, the, we, we came to Istanbul because um, it is Istanbul in the sense that uh, it's a great historic city, um, and uh, that it's growing rapidly, that its geographical position um, is very, very critical globally, um, and so we want to get our head around it um, in terms of applicable technologies at the urban scale, transportation, um, and neighborhoods. Um, and the thing that we think is, is really interesting about um, uh, Istanbul is the structure of neighborhoods. Uh, like, you know, geographically, because of the fact that 
the, the city is not a, um, a classic center periphery diagram. Um, it's like both centralized and linear. Um, it's divided uh, along one axis, but linear in another axis. I mean, all of those things make it super interesting when you think about it in terms of classic urban design models. And it, the, the curious thing for uh, me is the idea that potentially, as an urban formation, that, that if you think about it at the neighborhood scale of the development of individual neighborhoods, that that might be one way to, to read Istanbul. Um, but, but if that's the case, what it, what it might do then is to think, uh, enable us to think about ways in which architects could design at the neighborhood scale. Um, and if we did, just what would that mean in terms of transportation? And the interesting thing about the uh, neighborhood scale with respect to transportation is that by definition, a neighborhood is, is a convenient place to get around. That it's easy for, for one to get from um, where you live to a grocery store or wherever it might be. That's really by definition what your neighborhood is. It's also the place that you transition from one form of transportation to all others. Um, that you go, you transition from walking to whether it's bike or bus or subway, light rail, um, or car. And so in that way, you can think about the boundary of the neighborhood as that very limit between two modes of transportation. And if the big problem in transportation is the idea of the first kilometer and the last kilometer, that it's super easy, or not easy, but that it's clear how you're going to get from your beginning point to your destination point 90% um, of the way. But the hardest part is the beginning point and the end point um, in terms of parking or whatever it might be, or if you take public transportation, it's much longer the first and last kilometer. That if that holds true, then it means that the neighborhood is going to be essential in terms of resolving those challenges. So that, that's just a long way to say that that's the inspiration for us in terms of, of um, this temple. Uh, and if we were to create a new conspiracy theory, it would be around neighborhoods in this temple. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. Um, my question is regarding the second part of your research. Mm -hmm. Okay, so my question uh, is regarding the second part of your research about the building systems. Um, I'm wondering how you would, or maybe it's better to say, if you would extend your Mies analysis to Rainer Benham and his idea of mechanical technology and Maybe a contemporary example would be, a translation would be um, Diller and Scofidio's Blur project uh -huh. where the exterior and interior kind of dissolves and the conventional architecture elements starts to fade away. So where that would take your research? Yeah, great. That's like, uh, yeah, that's so great. I mean, um, when, when uh, we started this, you know, I, I mean, I had always heard of uh, um, architecture in the well-tempered environment, the Rainer Bannon book, but I never read it. And so when I read it, it was really like as if, uh, I don't know, like I was reading pornography or something. I was reading something I was not supposed to because it had like all of the answers of the things that we were researching. And what I thought was also really, but the, one of the things that's so beautiful that he says is that, um, that he's going to present in his book not the greatest buildings, um, maybe not even the buildings that are in the, something like the top third of, of great buildings, but he's going to talk about buildings that really work. And he goes through this history where he tries to, to inventory um, the different kinds of mechanical systems and building. So I really think for us, this is like the, the um, precedent that, that we want to follow. Um, and that I, I, I do think that he, he tries to think about mechanical systems not just as a cultural phenomenon. So it's not like, um, like you know, if Gideon is really good at trying to, at, at defining a zeitgeist, and if Gideon describe it in terms of uh, uh, an interest in technology in general, but he kind of missed out on mechanical systems. I don't think of Bantams as the, the, the thing that fills in for that missing part in Gideon. I kind of think he really tries to not only think about it as a cultural phenomenon, but to think about how the way the architects design and tries to think of, of options for, for designers. And so in that sense, you know, I think it's, it's very much sympathetic to that. With respect to the Blur building, it's like one of, you know, 
our favorite buildings in that sense because of the fact that uh, it's just atmosphere, and the atmosphere is produced by mechanical systems. Um, uh, and you know, the, the the thing that's great about the building is that um, in compliance with Swiss law, um, in terms of um, uh, fire suppression, uh, the system needed the building had to be sprinklered. Um, so the misters themselves did not qualify for the fire suppression system. So there's a second system of water that goes through the building um, that's that's used to protect the envelope of what, of, of water um, that is the building. I mean that just seems to me totally <coughs> insane. Um, you know the the fact that. The system that was so brilliant and elegant in terms of thinking of, of the way that you can design a building envelope um, actually had to have um, a second system um, that essentially legally defined what the envelope of the building is. So, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think I love the building. I, th it, I think it's really interesting once you put this lens on of thinking about building systems that even ones like that then suddenly become new to you in the, in the way that you. you um, think about it. The, the, the second thing, unrelated to building systems, that I love about the building is that, um, that uh, you know, the, the city that commissioned it wanted it to be an icon, um, an iconic building like um, uh, Bilbao. Um, and so they, they produced all of these images of the building, um, uh, you know, for, for to promote the city. But, like, how do you how do you design an icon when the building is a bunch of mist? Um, so, you know, we, we collected all these images of um, efforts to iconize the building, but, you know, it's impossible to do because it's not really a building. Any other questions? I, I mean, I have a question for you. Like, like um, I kind of feel like, like, do you think it's just normal for architects to do research, or do, do you think it's just like, I mean, uh, you know, or like, here's this person on stage that's direct, decided to take an alternative direction to, to practice, and you know, that that's just, that's, that's what it is. I mean, I, I mean, I, like, uh, like, I mean, I think it's actually something where, as a practicing architect, it is important to do research. It's not like something like, um, we've decided not to do architecture and just do research instead. Um, and what we try to do in, in our office, um, when, when you think about it paired with CLAB, um, is to think about applied research of the topics that we come up with and are thinking about more generally um, through CLAB. But I don't know, or, or is that just normal for you guys? Yeah, what? <laughs> Oh, good, 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 okay, all right, okay. Oh, okay, thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank you for your time, thank you.